so that we get the money together. Good. All right, guys, let's jump into this. Uh, disappointingly cold this weekend, but that's okay. Um, so some quick uh, administrative stuff about Project 3. Everyone should have gotten two emails in the last week or so. The first email should have been from this morning that gives you instructions about how to access the, the MemSQL machines. I remember we had three of them, so you, you basically um, you request them, and you, if they're available, you'll get it. Uh, and then you can log into it and do whatever you want to do with it. Uh, and everyone, how, you have root access to, to the machine, but be mindful of that every 24 hours it blows away the kernel and wipes the machine uh, entirely. So that you have an NS, NFS mount that you can read and write files to dis, and that are persisted beyond the machine getting wiped. Uh, but if you go down and change the kernels or install packages, when you come back, you may have to do it again. And the second email should have been from last week from this thing called Narwhal, which is basically the Emulab infrastructure we're using for the PDL. And everyone should have gotten an account that would allow them to then follow the instructions and log in and request the machines. So has anybody here tried to do this yet, other than Lynn? Try to use the machines. OK. That's OK. Um, we also are getting a donation from, uh, from a hardware manufacturer. Uh, and so we'll be getting more DRAM for all those machines. So currently they have 16 gigs, but we're getting, we're getting more later on. Uh, and then the other reminder for, for, for project number three is that this class, class on Wednesday, every group will have to give a five minute presentation about what the current status of their project is. It's basically the same thing you guys told me last week, right? Plus a demo or whatever else we, we talked about. And it's just really just to give a, um, an update to the other people in the class about what, how, what are you doing and how far you've gone in, in your project. Um, yes? This Wednesday, not next. What are that? Oh, yeah, sorry. This coming, coming Wednesday, whatever, the 13th. Yeah. Um, so I have to admit, I, I was actually uh, very impressed and pleased with everyone's status of their projects for the most part uh, last week. Uh, have you ever watched that video with like, Randy Pausch when he gave it, like, his last lecture? He talks about how he had this like, animation class and the, he was blown away, blown away by the kids' like, first projects where they, or they did a status update. So he didn't know what to tell him when he went back to class. So he told him he was disappointed so that people would work even harder and do, you know, go, go even beyond what they were already doing. I thought about doing that, but that would be kind of like a dick move. And I actually am honestly impressed with some of the things you guys are doing. Uh, I'm quite happy. Uh, I'm actually really impressed also, too, that other groups are coordinating with, with, with each other, right? Some people need a thread pool, some people need this and that, and you guys are working together and making sure you're not duplicating the effort and, and you know, pulling changes from each other. So I, I was, overall, I'm very pleased. Um, so we'll see how things go on, on Wednesday. All right, so for today's class, this is sort of the last lecture we're doing on uh, sort of runtime execution optimizations for queries, right? We talked about query compilation, we talked about scan sharing, we talked about compression. Uh, so today for vectorization, this is sort of the last additional thing you could do in a modern database system to, your, to speed up your operations. And then starting next week, we'll talk about how you deal with uh, databases that exceed the, si the size of memory you have, the amount of DRAM you have available to the machine. So this is sort of the last, last lecture on speeding things up, and then we'll finish off with talking about um, uh, we'll talk, finish up talking about like storage stuff. So we'll talk about a little bit about the background of vectorization, why it matters, why it's important, what it, what it means. Uh, and then I want to spend most of the time talking about the, the, the paper you guys are assigned reading, this, these vectorized algorithms that the guys at Columbia came up with um, and sort of go through so at a high level some basic uh, examples of actually how you use SIMD instructions, how you use vectorizations on modern CPUs to increase the, you know, the amount of interest instruction level parallelism you can get during query execution. And then I'll finish up talking a little bit about uh, the bit weaving technique from Wisconsin. And this is like a storage format for columnar databases that is sort of can natively be used in SIMD instructions, which I think is kind of cool. I don't think actually any real system implements this, although the, the Wisconsin guys were, were bought by Pivotal about a year or so ago. So that might end up in, in, their, in their systems. All right, so uh, normally I like to start off the lectures with like an observation about here's something that's hard, here's something that's challenging, here's something we have to consider about, consider in you know, how we design our database system. Uh, but sort of the observation we would want to make about why we want to do vectorization is pretty obvious, and everyone should, should have already heard it before. So I'm just going to come out and claim that this is, this is obvious, this is easy, uh, this is a no-brainer about why we want to do vectorization. I want to include some other stuff that I think are pretty obvious, obvious observations as well. 
So first is obviously building a database system is hard. Everyone's been doing a lot of hard work on this. It's a lot of you know, thinking about concurrency, thinking about memory, thinking about correctness is, is difficult. Uh, if you go to Taco Bell, you're probably going to get stomach problems. That's sort of obvious too. Uh, I haven't been there in a while, but the last time I went there, it was a rough ride. And then obviously the last one is uh, new CPUs are not getting any faster. Right? You've all heard of the, sort of the, 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 the people pretending the end, of the end of Moore's Law, that the CPUs are on a single core, they're not ratcheting up the, the, the frequency, the clock frequency, like they did in the 90s. Right? And instead, the way we're going to get parallelism uh, or get better performance and, and keep scaling up Moore's Law is adding more cores. Right? And so that we've already sort of talked about doing the multi-core stuff when we talk about scheduling and other things when we, and join algorithms. But now we're going to look at another type of parallelism we can have within a single core itself. So before we get into that, I want to spend some time talking about what the, sort of the, the, the state of the art is for modern CPUs. And there's basically two variants right, that, that are out there today. So the first is the, what I call multi-core C CPUs, or many-core CPUs. And this is essentially what everyone is familiar with. Like when you buy a machine you know, from, from Dell or HP or whatever, like you get one of these CPUs. And so these are, are exemplified by having a small number of really high-powered cores. Uh, so you can think of something like Intel Hoswell, Skylake, Nehalem. All of these, are, these architectures are based on, on, this, on this, this design. When I say high power, I mean like not only is it drawing a lot of power, but the CPU has a lot of additional instructions, a lot of different uh, optimizations baked in, like the pipeline, scheduling, and all the stuff that it can do uh, to make it run faster. Um, and so these, these types of CPUs are, have two key characteristics. The first is that they're super scalar. And the second one is that they support out-of-order execution. So super scalar basically means that the, the, the CPU can execute more instructions than it would at, at a given clock cycle uh, in parallel across different units or uh, computational units on the CPU than it would if it was just executing them sequentially one after another. Right, so you could have a bunch of instructions, and at a clock tick, you could have, you know, you're doing a floating pointing operation on this piece, and then arithmetic on this piece, or whatever else you want that, that the CPU supports. And the out of order means that within a pipeline, you can have all these instructions being executed and not in the order that they were actually invoked by the program. Because the CPU can make decisions that, oh, I have this data locally in my cache, so I'll execute this instruction right away. But then for this other one that actually came before it, I need to go do something else to make, you know, get the data I need in first, so I'll, I'll hold off doing that. So like you think of like, you say I have two instructions, or you know, A equals A plus B, or sorry, A equals A plus one, and B equals B plus one. Even though the program will execute A and then followed by B, the CPU is allowed to reorder them, right, because those operations are commutative. So internally what's going to happen in the hardware, they're going to have all these, uh, they have a dynamic dependency checker that's going to look at all the instructions and what data they're accessing and make decisions about how to order them such that they, they appear that they were executed in serial order, even though they were doing this in parallel. The other type of CPU that you may not be more, more familiar with is these, sort of in the last 10 years or so, these things called many integrated cores or MIX. Um, and so these are sort of these new coprocessor CPUs where they're designed to sort of supplement like a, a, a Hoswell CPU from Intel. So the, 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 the most common one is the Intel Xeon Phi. Uh, NVIDIA has their Tesla stuff. Um, and the basic idea is that rather than having a small number of really high-powered cores, when I say small, I mean like you know, it's 4, 6, 8, 12. I think Intel just announced that you have 18 now uh, that's coming out later this year. Uh, so when I say a larger number, I mean like in, in, in the several dozens or even hundreds uh, in, in the near future. But the key thing about this is that each of the cores are going to be, uh, each individual core will be less powered than the core you have in the Hoswell chip. Right? And they're actually based on the, 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 the Intel Pentium 1 architecture that they developed in the 1990s. Right? So it's now called, it's originally called Intel P4, P54, and now they have the C, that has some additional stuff to do, uh, SIMD and other things. So each individual core is less powerful, but it's going to be, you're going to have way more of them. Right? So if you have something that can be easily paralyzed in this kind of environment, which a database system can be, uh, you may actually end up seeing, seeing better performance than what you would see in like a, 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 um, in a sort of a commonplace or a, the, the, the commodity CPU like the Hoswell. 
So the key difference also too is that these guys are non-superscalar and they're only going to do in-order execution. So you have a sequential stream of instructions. Each individually, each one of these individual Pentium cores is going to execute them in exactly in that order. It's not going to try to do any branch prediction or, or jump ahead in, in the pipeline. And so the way they're going to get around, even though this, 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 each core is less powerful, they're going to supplement it with additional SIMD instructions and larger SIMD registers that allow you to do more of the type of parallel computations that we're going to talk about in this class. So it's not going to make, obviously, your operating system run faster. But if you have some kind of high performance computing program or a parallel database system, then you should see a, a significant improvement uh, using these guys. So if you've never seen what one of these coprocessor looks like, they basically are just like the, you know, the GPUs. right? They, they sit in the PCI Express bus. Uh, and they, they, you know, they can read memory off of that, right? So it, does, it look, basically looks like a GPU. Intel announced that they're having the, uh, I think later this year or early next year, I forget the, the code name for it, but they're actually going to have now the Xeon 5s actually be socket CPUs. So you could have like one socket be like your Haswell chip, and then another socket be uh, your your Xeon 5. They actually might even be on the same the same silicon. Right, and that'll get you. That'll get rid of the problem of having to move everything back and forth over this bus. They're not that expensive either, right? They're only like two to three thousand dollars. Right, this is not talking about whatever that new thing Nvidia announced last week. That's like a hundred thousand dollars, the GGX or whatever, right? These things aren't that aren't, aren't that expensive, right? But they're obviously they're not something that you can go rent on Amazon EC2, right? You'd have to have this in your local machine. The question. From doing execution? Is it like very um, expensive to compute the dependency and stuff? This question is what prevents the, the Xeon 5 core from doing out of work execution? Yeah, so you need, you need to add additional uh, circuitry on, on the silicon to handle all that, right? And now you're taking up more space, and now it needs more power, so now you can't have as many, many cores, right? Trying to keep it this very simple, and then I think Pentium One was the first one that actually supported uh, out-of-order execution in the '90s. But for whatever reason, I don't. These guys don't do this. I think they changed that to get avoid that to get around that, and then you know add more computation stuff for the SIMD, SIMD stuff. All right. So, um, like I, said, I I'm not a Harvard person. I just find this stuff kind of interesting because it definitely is relevant. It's definitely something you have to consider when you're building a, a you know modern database system. OK, so just as a high level, this is sort of what the architecture looks like. So this, this is what everyone's seen before. You have your, your Haswell chips. You have a single socket CPU, say it has four cores. Each core is going to have its own private L1, L2 cache. And then they'll share an L3 cache. And the, the hardware runs some cache coherence protocol to make sure that you know, if one guy does a write in here, everybody sees it. Um, the Intel Xeon FIs follow a ring bus format, but I don't think they have a L3 cache. So everybody has their local L1, L2, and then if they need to send messages to each other, it goes over this, uh, this ring bus. So this is different than that 1,000 core paper you guys read earlier, where that was sort of that, that giant mesh network. And that's sort of based on the architecture that Tylera uses for their chips. Right? The Xeon Phi use, uses a ring bus, as opposed to like a 2D mesh. All right, so given that this is what the world looks like, and given that there's this new coprocessors, the Xeon Phi's that are available to us, uh, how do we actually get, take advantage of them? So what we don't want to do is just take our you know, existing parallel queries that we've talked about before and just throw it on, on these CPUs, because they're not going to run as fast as, as the Hoswells, even though we may have more of them. Um, so what we want instead then is look at how to rely on this additional vectorization SIMD functionality that they're adding to these coprocessors to speed up the operation on a single core. So when we talked about uh, query scheduling and execution, that was using multiple cores. Uh, when we talked about query compilation, that was sort of like you know, making sure that each individual core does something in a smart way. So now, we're again, we're, we're dealing with a single core. How do we use the hardware to its fullest potential? And how do we take advantage of, of these, these new instructions? So the basic idea of, of vectorization is we want to take an existing program, i.e. Our, our, our database system, and instead of having it process a single pair of data or a single piece of data on a single instruction, we want to take a single instruction and have it operate on multiple pieces of data at the same time. And this is essentially the, the SIMD stuff that we talked about before, which I'll, I'll go over again. So there's basically two ways to get vectorization. The first way is, is to do this automatically in your compiler. So you can set some flags in, in, in the compiler and say, go ahead and try to find instructions that are together inside of a loop 
and replace them with the corresponding uh, SIMD operations. So this is different than unrolling a loop. Right? Unrolling loop basically takes the, the, you know, the one instruction you would run in the, in the loop and you add it multiple times corresponding to you know, multiple iterations. This is taking those multiple iterations, instead of having multiple instructions, having that single SIMD instruction uh, if the hardware supports it to do whatever is the operation it is that you want to do. So uh, this is very hard to do, obviously, and the, the, the support you get for this is, is not that great in compilers, um, even like ICC, like the commercial one from Intel. Uh, and it's definitely the case that this is probably not going to work for the most part in, in, our, in our database system. Now, I'm, I'm ignoring the query compilation stuff that we talked about two weeks ago. Right, that's a whole other ball game. But in general, if you take the interpreted uh, query plan execution model that we talked about, that the the workflow of of those of that program depends on what not only what the database looks like, but also what the query plan looks like. So the compiler is going to have no way to predict that. Oh yeah, these are the operations you want to do. Let, let me vectorize it. So if we turn this flag on, chances are we're not going to see a really big improvement. You know, if we're not doing query compilation, which we'll, you know, we're ignoring for now. And obviously, it requires you to have actually the hardware that actually supports these SIMD instructions. Right? It doesn't help you if you're, if you're invoking these things and the hardware's like, I'm not, I can't do this anyway. So what we're going to focus on instead is do this manual vectorization. So we, as the database internal developers, we're highly skilled, we're highly paid, we're highly attractive. Right? Uh, it's our job to look in our code and come up with the ways to, to, to do this. Because we, we, we're not going to rely on the compiler. And we're not gonna, the operating system can't do this for, uh, for us either. So basically, three categories of things that we want to look at. So the first one's the most obvious. And this is dealing with the linear access on, on our database. right? So this is doing a sequential scan. And we're doing the same set of operations over and over again as we look for, uh, you know, look for matches, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever it is we're trying to do. I should also say, too, that we're, we're focusing on OLAP here, right? OLTP can't really help you from vectorization because you're doing point queries to find one thing. Maybe you had, if you had a batch of, of queries all at the same time that are trying to look in the same index or do, do something, you may want to vectorize that. But I feel like the overhead of, of managing that would be very difficult. So we're really talking about OLAP here where you know you're going to do long scans on the data. So predicate evaluation can be vectorized. Compression and decompression can be vectorized. Right, because we know that we're going to be, do, you know, doing the same thing over and over again. Building upon that, we can also do uh, ad hoc vectorization on the sorting and merging algorithms. We've talked about this a little bit before when we talked about the sort merge join. Right, we showed you how you can parallelize this across uh, different different cores. But now we can, within that single core, we can parallelize it even further by using SIMD. And then at the bottom, we can do composable operations. So we can build up between all of these and actually build data structures now that can be used in, in a vectorized manner. And then with all of these together, we can build up more complicated algorithms or more complicated functionalities in our database system that are completely vectorized. And we'll see the performance pr improvement you get from that is, is, quite, is quite good um, for the, in the right conditions. So we talked about this earlier for, when we talked about sort join. Um, but I'm going to spend a little time just going over it again. So the SIMD instruction setter, which is sort of redundant because it's single instruction and multiple data, it's this class of CPU instructions that all modern CPUs are going to have that allow you to do that, take, a same op take one operation and apply it to multiple data points that are stored in these special registers. So this is, think, think of this, this is almost like assembly coding, right? You're, you're no longer dealing with these arbitrary locations in memory and, and, and manipulating them in some way. Now you're actually writing individual values into individual registers and applying operations on them. And the CPU can do this, can do this very efficiently. Um, so all the major instruction sets that are out there today have their versions of SIMD operations. We've already talked about the x86, MMX came first, SSE are the, the ones that most people use today, and AVX are more complicated ones. The PowerPC guys have this thing called Altavec, and then the ARM guys, some of the ARM implementations have this called Neon. And again, they, they all basically can do the same thing, it's just what the differences between them is how big are the registers, what type of uh, values they can support, are they floating point registers, fixed point registers, uh, the names of, of the functions you invoke on them or the CPU intrinsics are going to be different from one, one architecture to the next. Um, and I actually don't know whether there's a good, anybody has a good abstraction library that it can handle everything, right? For the most part, you will usually write the direct you know, intrinsics for the instruction set you're working on. 
Um, but maybe there's something out there I just don't know about. So to give an example of SIMD again, uh, this is the same one we saw before. We want to do, uh, we want to add two vectors, x and y, and produce a new output vector z. And so the way you would write this in scalar code, you would have a for loop. And for every single uh, offset or index in, in, the, in each vector, you add them together and produce an output. So under single instruction, single data item, you would spin through this loop and go through and do, do this addition one by one. Now maybe your compiler can be smart about this and do unrolling so that you can do a bunch of them all at the same time. But for, for that, we just ignore. But even then, if you, if you do loop unrolling, you're still invoking all those instructions. You just may not be having that, that, that branching loop, right? Which, which, which is expensive in a uh, superscalar architecture. But with SIMD, we can take the first four values, pack that into a uh, SSE register, and take from, from the first vector and take the next four values to this other vector. And then within the single invocation, we get a single output. Right? And we do this again for the other, the other, other offsets in the, in, the, in the vectors, and we produce our final answer. So what took, uh, you know, was that four, eight instructions to do the, the addition across all these guys when we were doing a uh, single instruction, single data item? can take basically two instructions to do it here. Right? So this is the kind of speed up we can get. Now you obviously have to do a bunch of stuff to get the data to pack it into these, these registers, um, which we'll talk about later on. But that's, you know, it's even then that's going to be less than the, what you would have to do in the, in the scalar case. So the, the main thing that we'll focus on are these SSE instructions. Uh, the latest version, SSE4. There's AVX, I think, is just the same thing, but it supports uh, larger types, larger data types. Um, and so basically what happens is you have these 120-bit registers, and you can pack four 32-bit values in them. Then they have these whole, these whole, all these function calls you can make on them to produce the answer that you want. Um, so this first was introduced in Intel 1999, and as I said, all the modern... Uh, the modern variants of the Intel architecture, not only in the Hoswell, like the, 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 so the, the commodity CPUs, but as well as the, the Xeon Phi coprocessors support this stuff. So the kind of things you can do are, are pretty straightforward. So obviously you can move data in and out of the registers. You can do all the, 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 the basic arithmetic operations you would expect, um, as well as the logical operations. Um, and then you can do comparisons, but the ones that are kind of more interesting are due to do ability to do shuffles and conversions and cache control. So the shuffle allows you to move data directly between different registers without having to go back into the memory bus or back into the CPU's caches. Um, and then conversion allows you to convert data from uh, sort of the x86 or the, um, the CPU cache format into the SIMD format. But the one that's actually really cool and, and it's kind of relevant to us is the ability to have data move out of the SIMD registers directly into memory without having to write into the CPU caches or pollute your CPU caches. And so this is actually matters in, in, in the context of database systems because if you imagine you're joining two really large tables uh, and the output of the join can't be used until you finish the join operation. So when you compute the join and find a matching tuple, you don't really care about putting it into the CPU caches because you're not going to access it right away again. Right? So instead, you want to put it into this temporary buffer in memory so that when your join operation finishes, you go to the next operator in your query plan, and then you can pick up and start using it there. Right? So this allows you to, sometimes it's called streaming stores, but basically this allows you to move data directly from these SIMD uh, registers into memory. So this is why I kind of think it's like assembly programming, because you're actually dealing with, a, you know, at the fine grain level where your data actually is in. Is it in the registers, is it in the caches, or is it in, the, or is it in DRAM? Okay, so this brings us to the paper you guys were assigned to read. Uh, I actually really like this paper. It's, it's, it's actually really new. It's actually from 2015, so it's not even a year old yet uh, in Sigma last year. And what I like about it is that they go through basically all the different operations you, you can have uh, in your database system and show you how to vectorize them. All the papers that, that came before this have always been like, you know, here's how you do a sorting in, in a vectorized format. Here's how you do hashing, right? They actually do, uh, treat everything and look at and examine everything. Now, I realize in the appendix, there's all this like gnarly C code, and hopefully you guys didn't read that. But it's a, it's a good reference to know that that you know if you ever actually had to implement this yourself, I think this is the go-to paper. There's some typos in it which I need to email them about, but this is the go-to paper that just tells you how to do vectorized operations in a database system. 
um, which, I, which I really like. So the basic premise of this paper, of what, they, what they've done, or what the main contribution of it is, is that they're going to show you how to take fundamental vectorized operations and then build upon them to do more complicated things and add more complex functionality in the database system. Right, so you're going to start with basic things like selective stores, selective loads, scatter and gathers, and then we'll build up from that to actually do partitioning, doing histograms, bloom filters, and other things. So we'll just focus on the high-level stuff here going forward, uh, and we won't get into the nitty-gritty details because it's kind of hard to like show code examples in a lecture and say, here's the instruction you want to do to make this work. So I'll just show you the, the basic ones that I think are relevant. Um, and then if you wanted to know, learn more, you, you, know, you could read the paper further and see exactly how they did different things. Another key observation they make in this paper is that they show how to do vertical vectorization to get better performance over horizontal vectorization. And I'll show what that, what that means in a second. But the basic idea here is that, yes, th there's two different ways to use these vectorized instructions. And by trying to consume as much as you can from your input and vectorize those operations, that's better than just vectorizing the sort of the, the target thing that you're that you're looking at. We'll, we'll show this example when we talk about hash tables. Question or no? Okay. Um, another cool thing they do about this paper is also they try to fully utilize the SIMD registers, the lanes in the SIMD register, as much as possible as they go along, and. This means that they can peek ahead in the input and add it, you know, add it to the computation rather than just sort of waiting until your, your current batch is done before you go to the next batch. Um, and I'll show, we'll show what it means in a, in a second. So by lane, I just mean like think of a slot in the CMD register. Like I have a 128-bit CMD register. I can put four 32-bit values in it. Each 32-bit value is, is called a lane uh, in, in CMD parlance. Okay, so we're going to go through the fundamental operations, uh, and then we'll build from that and show how to do scans, hash table probes, and, and build histograms. So the first one we have to deal with is selective load. And so the top point here, the top data item, is, is their target vectors. So this is the thing we want to write into. And so what we want to do here is we want to be able to take the contents of some location in memory and selectively write it into our, our vector. So we have a, this mask here that corresponds to the different lanes. And so if it has a 0, it says we want to overwrite it. If it has a 1, sorry, if a 0 says we want to not overwrite it, if there's a 1, we do want to overwrite it. So in this case here, what would happen is we would look at the first 0, at this, this first point in the mask, we'd skip it because it's a 0, but then we come to the 1, and now we know we need to overwrite uh, B. So we would go to the first location at our starting point in memory, and that's the value that would get writ written up in here. Right, so it doesn't, it's not an exact like straight line shot up. It's like from this starting point, I'll start adding in values uh, going from left to right. D keep going further, we skip the zero, then we come to the one, and same thing, we overwrite it there. So selective store is the reverse of this. We have uh, some location of memory we want to start writing to, and then we have a mass that corresponds to what. Uh, whether we should write the values that, that, are, that exist in our input target vector. So in this case here, we start with the first zero, uh, we, we ignore that, uh, we, we ignore this, the A, and then we get the one here, and we know we need to write into the first slot the value that corresponds to this slot or lane in, in the vector. Keep going with zero, we skip that, and we get to the last one we get here. All right, is this sort of clear, how we're doing this? All right, this is different than just sort of taking the entire chunk of memory and writing it directly into, uh, into our vector, into mem you know, in, in memory and out of the SIMD register and, and memory. And the reason why we want to be able to do this is because when we do comparison operators, right, and we're, say we're doing a scan, and we, or a join, we would see whether you know, something should be emitted in the output of our operator, we want to be able to generate these masks and selectively say, here's the, here's, you know, the, here's the tuple we want to put in, and ignore all these other ones. Right, because that way we can do all the comparisons directly on the SIMD registers, because the SIMD instructions support those comparison operators, and we don't have to copy, keep copying things back and forth between the CPU caches and the SIMD stuff. So the idea is that we're going to use these to do as much computation as, as we can out on the SIMD registers and selectively pull back the data that we need. For selective gather, uh, so the, the scatter and gather stuff, it's different than, if, you, if you're familiar with the parlance in distributed query processing. So scatter, gather, query, and distributed, just 
distributed databases means you take a query and you scatter across as many nodes, and then you gather back the results. This is actually scatter gather in actually the data items itself. Yes? No, you have to load things sequentially. Sorry, say it again? Uh, does it have to load things sequentially for the so, selected load? Yeah, so his question is for the selected store, does it, is this done... Uh, uh, for, for load. Uh, for load. Okay. Is this done in parallel or is this done uh, in, in serial order? The answer is uh, it's done actually in almost serial order. So the L1 cache only supports one or two accesses per cycle. So you can't like take this whole thing and like suck it right up because the, the architect, the hardware won't support that. So you would write the code as a selective store, as, as, a, as an intrinsic, and it looks like from you as the programmer, it's doing it in parallel, but in reality, since you're pulling stuff from L1 cache, it's going to take a couple, couple cycles. It's a good question. Okay, so the selective gather, uh, what we're going to do here is we want to have now a vector uh, that we want to update, and then we have an index vector that corresponds to what value from memory should we update in, in each slot here. So in this case here, the first one, the two, would correspond to offset number two, and that would get written there. One corresponds there, five corresponds here, and everything, everything gets overwritten. All right? You're sort of gathering together different locations in memory and, and putting it in our vector. Scatter does, does the reverse of this. Now our index vector corresponds to locations in our uh, value vector. And when we start doing the applying, applying this mapping, that tells us where we write into our, our contents of memory. Right? So selective load is taking a mask of ones and zeros and says, should this, you know, this, for, this locate, for this tuple or this value, should it go into my, my value vector of memory? The gathering is basically saying, I, I know which offset I, I want to get values in. So sort of related to his question uh, is the gather and scatter stuff uh, are not truly executed in parallel because you can only have so many cycles to the L1 cache, um, or sorry, how many, how many reads to the L1 cache per cycle. And then the, in the Hoswell chips, the gathers are only supported in the newer versions. And so in the, in the, the older versions, they sort of emulate it. So again, you have a CPU intrinsic, and then the compiler will generate multiple instructions to actually do the data movement. Um, and then the selected loads and stores are not truly in parallel as well. They're done with these sort of permutations or, or not as bad as done in, in scalar or sequential order, but not as good as, they, as if they were in truly parallel, right? But for the Xeon 5s, I, they, they support all of this in parallel. OK, so. So now we, now we know the basic building blocks. Let's not so now start sort of, sort of building up the stack and do more complicated things. So we're going to focus on sequential scans, hash table probing, and then we won't do the shuffle phase and partitioning because that's a bit more complicated. But we'll show how to build the, the histogram in parallel that you would need to do radex partitioning that we talked about when we did sort merge. And then again, the paper provides additional instructions on how to do the joins, the sorting, and bloom filters and other things, building upon what, what we've talked about here. All right, so for our sequential scan, which is probably the most important thing we can do and we want to vectorize, for this example, I'm going to use the simple query here, select star from table, where the key is greater than or equal to some low value, and the key is greater than or equal to some high value. So I'm going to show you first how to do this in the, sort of the, the scalar way, the non-vectorized version. And I'm going to show two variants of this. I'll show you how to do it in a branching and a non-branching way. And then from this, we'll show you how to do this in, in, in the vectorized. We'll, we'll build upon what these, these instructions are doing. Or build upon what these, these, these more primitive uh, ways are doing this. So the, the branching way to do a sequential scan is essentially what everyone would write if you build your database system for the first time, you, sort of, you implement the scan operator. You have some for loop that's going to iterate over every single tuple in the table. You'll extract the key that you're using for your, your predicate. And you'll compare to see whether it's, it's greater than or equal to the low value or less than or equal to the high value. And if that evaluates true, then you'll copy the output of the tuple into, or copy the tuple into some output buffer that you're maintaining to produce the intermediate result for this operator. And then you increment a counter to say, to, to move to the next position in the output buffer. So that when you come back the next time and you have a match, it goes into to the, ne the next slot. 
so the key problem with this approach is this if clause here, right? Because the, in a superscalar architecture like the, the, the Haswell, if the branch prediction gets, gets this wrong, then it has to basically flush the, pot, the pipeline and, and pull in the, the more instructions. Right, because remember, it's, it's for each instruction, each clock cycle, they're executing a bunch of extra stuff, and the CPU is trying to mask its you know, regular slowness by doing as much as it can in parallel, and then checking later on to see whether that was the right thing to do. So this if clause, it's hard to get this right, because it not only depends, again, what the contents of the database is, but it depends on what the query is. So if you have, say, a, a selection scan, a predicate that evaluates all tuples are true, and then it should be able to handle that. But if all, all tuples are evaluated to false, it should be able to handle that. But as soon as it, you find one that doesn't match what it's expected but from before, you pay a big penalty in a superscalar architecture like the Hoswell for having this branch mi misprediction. So an alternative way to doing a sequential scan without having an if clause is to do something like this, where we're still going to iterate every, every single tuple, but then immediately we're going to copy the tuple into our output buffer. Right? We haven't even checked to see whether it matches yet. We're just going to say we, we, it might match. So we'll go ahead and copy it now. And then when you do the predicate evaluation, rather than having an if branch, you can replace it with a, uh, two ter ternary clauses or ternary operations that the CPU will probably replace with low-level addition and subtraction instructions. Because right? you, you can basically change this to an addition and then check the, you know, the, whether, check the overflow or something. Uh, so now we have a branchless invocation to, to evaluate a predicate, and then we get, we get some mass that says whether we, it, it evaluated true or not, and then if it's, if it's true, then, it, then this goes to one, so then we move our output buffer up by one. If it's zero, then we come back around and just overwrite the last thing we copied into it, because it didn't match. You know, sort of the, and there's some extra stuff you have to do to make sure that like, if the last guy evaluates to false, you don't actually include it in your output, but that's a, that's a minor thing. So this seems kind of crazy, right? This seems like you're doing all this extra copying over and over again for tuples that you're you may not, not even produce output. But as, a, as we'll see in a second on a superscalar architecture, this is actually the right thing to do if your selectivity is very low. All right, so now we can talk about how to do this in a vectorized uh, for, way. So for this, instead of having uh, iterating for every tuple in the table, I'm going to say v subscript t, and I realize you're reading code in class, and that sucks, but th this will be it. Uh, so here now we're saying we're going to get a batch of tuples, our vector tuples from our table, right, and we're going to operate on them every iteration in our for loop. And then we'll do the simd load uh, to, to grab all the, the key values and put it into this vector of keys. Then we apply our predicate, and this can be done in a SIMD operation, a comparison to take you know, a bunch of tuple values and apply the, the predicate to see whether they're, they're true or not. And we'll produce a vector mask. If, none of the, if, if at least one of the uh, offsets in our vector mask is true, then we go ahead and do our, our SIMD store. And this is that sort of selective store that we talked about before. We have this mask, whether it's one or zero, and then we can write it out to, to, to a memory location when it values are true. So let's look at an example about how this would actually work using those fundamental operations we talked about before. So for this, we'll say we have a our query is now select star from table where key is greater than or equal to zero, uh, O and key is less than or equal to U. And let's say that this is our, that's kind of hard to see, but hey, this is our sample data set here. We have two columns, we have a list of IDs, and then we have a list of, of, of keys, right? They're just you know, one character strings. So the first thing we're going to do, we'll use the, uh, we we'll use the, the, the selective store to, uh, sorry, the, 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 I guess the, the selective gather to take the memory location and put it into our, to our vector here. And this also should show you why the advantage, the advantage of using a, the DSM or the co column format, right? Because if this was a row store, we'd have to jump a, a bunch of different memory locations to take the values we want from this column and put it into our vector. Now, if we're looking at a lot of different columns or our, our tuples are really wide, then when we go fetch the block of this data, they may not all fit in our L1 cache. But in this case here, because everything's in a, in a column store, if we, if we assume it's in a column store, then we just jump this one offset and we can copy to, to the end of, of the vector of tuples we're looking at. They're all the data is contiguous and we can just write it into our, 
in, in, into our register. And that's really, really fast. So now we have this vector, and we'll use our, our SIMD compare to produce the mask, right? And it's one if evaluated true, or zero if evaluated false. And then we have another vector of all the offsets for the tuples that we're evaluating. For now, we're just assuming it's you know, zero, zero through, through five here. Right? But you can imagine as you're, as you're walking through the table, these things get adjusted as you go along. And then with this mask, we use the SIMD store to then write out a, the offsets that match for this tuple. So now we know that we, just have, we have one, three, and four match for, for, our, for our predicate. And then depending on what we're doing, early materialization or late materialization, we could then do additional SIMD instructions to get the rest of the data we need to produce the output because it's a select star query. Or we just pass these offsets along up into the other operators in a query plan and then let them worry about doing the materializ materialization later on. Is this sort of clear how, how we're doing this, right? So, so we took the data that we had in memory, we put it into a vector, and we can do all our operations in using directly on the SIMD registers without ever, ever having to go back to memory. The algorithm they show in the paper is obviously more complicated because you're, they have to deal with, with overflows and other things like that, but for that we, we ignore for now. So now we can look at the performance of this, right? So for this, we're going to compare the Xeon Phi versus the, the Haswell multi-core. Um, so the Xeon Phi has 61 cores plus four times hyperthreading. So for each core, you have four sort of four program counters, four threads. And then the Haswell chip has four cores plus 2x hyperthreading. So in total, you have eight cores. So the first thing we want to compare is how the scalar version uh, of the selection scan works with the, the branching. So what you see off the bat is uh, the Xeon Phi, because it has way more cores, it outperforms the, uh, the Haswell machine. Um, but as you get to sort of higher selectivities, you're, you're paying a you run out of cash room, or you run out of room in your cash, and you're always writing things out to memory. Uh, so they sort of converge on, on performance here. Um, so you're bottlenecked on the memory bandwidth. But now if we add the branchless version of the selection scan, we see something very interesting. So the first is that the branchless actually works, performs worse in the Xeon Phi than the, the, the branching version. But in the Haswell machine, for the low selectivities, right? so like, zero, like this 1% means 1% of the tuples be selected by the, by the scan, the branchless version works better. So why, why? Why is this the case? No out-of-order execution. Right, no out-of-order execution. So if you, there's no, no branch misprediction penalty. So yes, we're copying more data, but that's OK, because the penalty of, of doing a branch misprediction in a superscalar architecture with a really long instruction pipeline is, is massive. So that's why this is performing better here. And of course, as you get over here, the, you just your, your bottleneck on, on the memory controller. Yes? Uh, but with such low selectivity, even, even in the branching case, the branch prediction should be low, right? For example, if it's zero selectivity, the branch prediction should be, should not get in. Uh, like it should yeah, so his, his statement is, if you have 0% selectivity, then the CPU should just be, you, pay, you may pay no penalty, assuming the CPU always predicts that it just should never match. Um, Yeah, you, yeah, you, you don't, you have no control over that. Yeah, um, I mean, and you can't provide hints to the compiler, or the, the, like to anything, to say, hey, look, this is never going to match, <laughs> right? What's that? In kernel queries? Oh, kernel. Yeah. Yeah, but do you have to be like in, in privilege mode to do that? Yeah. In the back, yes. Giving hints to the branch predictor. Yeah. 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 Can you do that? Yeah, we can do that. You can do that. Okay. I, so I don't know if they did that. Okay. All right. So and now we add back the vectorized case. Again, you see the Xeon Phi is clearly outperforming the, the Haswell. Uh, and this is because there's just so many extra cores for it to use, even though they're the less power, you know, they have less power. Um, because everything basically it's doing is you know, p almost purely in SIMD instructions. Uh, so you're taking advantage of everything that they, they've added to this architecture. Um, and of course, everything, all, again, converges to, to the same point here when, when you start to run out of cash. Or, and, you're, and, you're, and you're saturating the memory control. 
All right, so this is sort of, this is sort of clear. What well, seems like a terrible idea to do, do this copying every single time, even though you're not going to need the data, actually turns out to be perform well when you have low selectivity. All right, so uh, we don't have that much time, but I'll go through as much as I can. So the next thing that's kind of interesting is how to do this, how to do parallel hash tables. So there's, in the paper, they talk about how to do build the hash table in parallel, but I'm, I want to spend time talking about how to do probing in, in the hash table. So for this, we're going to assume we have an open hash table, open addressing, uh, right? So that means that we have some hash table that has these offsets so that correspond to keys. We'll hash some value. That tells us what, what slot we should start in. Then what happens is if you notice that your slot is full, you do a linear scan to keep going down until you find a free slot. If there's no more free slots, then you have to you know, rebuild the hash table. And this is different than like a hash table or, or where you have uh, a linked list of uh, conflicts or conf collisions of additional items. So to do this in the scalar way, you start with a single input key. Uh, we'll hash it. That gives us our hash index. And then we, find, we jump to that location take whatever the key is, is in there, and then we do a comparison to see whether they're, they evaluate to true or not. In this case here, key 1 does not equal key 9. So we'll scan down uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the hash table, keep evaluating the keys one by one until either we find an empty slot, meaning we know our key's not there, or we find our key and then we, then we have a match. So the way to do this, in a, in, if you're taking a sort of first pass, uh, in using vectorization is to use a bucketized hash table where for every single uh, slot in the hash table, we're going to have multiple, multiple key entries here. So what will happen is when we, we take our single key, we hash it, we get a hash index, we jump to locate, some location, and now we'll get, instead of a single key value back that we want to do a comparison, we'll get four. We put that into our, uh, into our SIMD vector, do our SIMD compare, and then see whether we get, a, we get a match, right? So the problem with this is that we're still iterating over the input that we're, that we're using to probe against our hash table one by one, right? So we're not, we're not speeding up any of our operations because if we have a, you know, a million keys, we have to do this a million times. Even though we can evaluate multiple keys that exist in the hash table in parallel, we're, not, we're still looking at the, the input for our probe in sequential order. So this is what they refer to as, as horizontal vectorization. So the way to do this even better is to do a, a vertical vectorization where we're going to look at a vector of input keys at a time, so a batch of the input keys that we want to probe into the database system, apply our hash function, produce a hash vector that we then put into uh, a SIMD register, then these jump to these different locations in, the, in our hash table, pull them back, using the SIMD gather operation, and then now we can do our SIMD comparison between these two guys. Right? And this is going to produce our mask for us that tells us what tuples evaluate to true. Now, a naive implementation for this would be we would, we would recognize that this fir the first key and the last key have matches, but the middle two guys don't. So what we would do is we would jump to the point where we left off with the middle two guys and move to the next slot and see whether we have, we have a match. Right? But then that means that these lanes here for the first and the last one are essentially being unused because we've already found a match for them. We don't need to keep looking. So what they propose to do is you actually recognize that when your mask produces ones in these slots here, you go back to your input vector and you, and you, you move forward to the next keys in your, in your sequence. So key one and key four got replaced with key five and key six. And then you keep, some, with some additional bookkeeping, you recognize that when I do my hashing, I want to hash the first one and the last one to a new location. But the middle two guys, I want to iterate for one, because right, I want to pick up where I left off and jump down to the next slot to look to see whether I have a match. So then now you can do your, your, your comparison this way. So the, this allows all the lanes in your SIMD registers to always be fully utilized, because right, you're not, you're not you're not looking for, for matches for things you already know you found a match. The downside is that uh, this makes the algorithm no longer stable. So meaning if I run the, with the same query and the same database on different times of the day, I may actually produce different answers because I'm shuffling the order of all, all these different operations. Or I'm shuffling the order of how I'm evaluating my, my input keys. 
right? So like key one, key four would come at my output, followed by key five and key six instead of key two and key three. So this is okay in a, in a relational database system because we're based on bag algebra. We have no notion of ordering. We just care to see whether a, a, a value exists in our bag or not. And if you really care about ordering, you can just do a, you know order by up above or sorting up above the query plan, and that will make your, your algorithm stable. So I don't really see that being a big issue. And then you get all the gain of, of, of again, full, uh, full lane utilization. So we can look at the performance of these two guys again. So now we're going to compare again the, 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 the Xeon Phi with the Haswell machine. So starting off with the scalar versions, we see again the Xeon Phi when we have really small hash tables that every, where everything fits in, 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 your, in your L1, L2 caches does quite well. And as you get to larger sizes, the, the, everybody gets worse. Um, but Again, this is basically taking advantage of all the extra cores. And they're all doing ve vectorization. And then we add the vectorized versions. And again, we see in the, the, the Xeon Phi, the vertical version does, does really well for the most part. Um, but there's a little, little switch here between the horizontal version and the vertical version as you get to larger hash table sizes. And I don't fully understand what, what was going on there. But the main thing to point out here is the, everybody converges to the same point when you run out of CPU caches. right? So in the Xeon Phi, each core does not have a, that big of a cache, right? So they, they, they sort of fall off around one megabyte. In the Haswell, each core has the L1, L2, and plus the L3. So they're much larger, and they can, they can deal with larger inputs for a longer, longer time. All right. So uh, now going further, we can do partitioning in a vectorized uh, manner. And for this, we're going to ignore the shuffling. We're just going to deal with how you built the histogram. Remember, when we talked about radix partitioning for the sort and merge join algorithms, you would do the radix partitioning to divvy up the tuples to different cores and allow them to then process them in parallel. So this is sort of the same thing, but now we're dealing with, on a single core, how do we generate that histogram for, for the tuples we're supposed to evaluate before we do the shuffling? So we can use the scatter and gather uh, fundamental operations to, to, to generate this histogram. And so the issue we have to deal with, though, is collisions when two values in our SIMD register hash to the same thing. So say there's an input vector, key 1, key 2, key 3, key 4. Uh, we use the SIMD uh, radix implementation to come up with the hash vectors. And then they both write it, and everything writes into this, this histogram vector uh, using the SIMD ads. But the problem is here is, again, uh, hash value 2 and hash value 4, both hash to the same locations. And this, the SIMD operations have no way to, to handle these conflicts. So both of these, both of the, these values, would, when you do the addition, would try to write to this location. And one would just get overwritten with another. So you would lose this count. So the way they handle this is they actually replicate the histogram so that each lane in our SIMD register has its own histogram. Again, now you can use that, that scatter operation to have them write to different, different parts. And then you just do a SIMD add to, to collapse it and produce the, the final answer you're looking for. So the thing before for this, for this value here, what we have plus 1, plus 1, can then be collapsed into plus 2, and we produce the right answer. Again, I'm not really explaining what's in memory versus out of memory. For the most part, you can kind of think you try to do as much as you can in, uh, in, your, in your SIMD registers. And this also assumes you're dealing with like key, you know, single keys. So this wouldn't quite work if you have a, you know, you're trying to partition on like three attributes in your table, right? That's sort of the, one of the major limitations we have in all, all of the SIMD stuff. To finish up with joins, uh, I'm not going to go through the algorithms how to do this, but basically they describe how to do a sort of the no, non-partitioning ways without any radix partitioning. And then having a partition table um, per thread, and having one, but only for the outer table. And then you can have one for both the inner table and the outer table. So they call the only the outer table is minimum partitioning, and then doing the grace hash join where you partition both the outer and the inner as max partitioning. And both of these implementations are, are fully vectorized, whereas the top one is only partially vectorized. So what you see is that. Uh, without no surprise, the grace hash join doing partitioning both things, and when it's fully vectorized, vectorized outperforms ev uh, everyone else. 
Right? And this is because you're doing as much computation as you can on the data as it exists in the registers without having to go back and forth between, between CPU and, and, and SIMD stuff. So I don't, there's not really much to stuff to say to here. It's just, uh, without any partitioning, the vectorize doesn't really help you. This is also in the Xeon Phi, so it's not, not the Haswell ch uh, chip. Um, with minimum partition, you get, you get a little bit of gain, but you see a, a significant improvement when you do the, the full partitioning. Okay. So in the last 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about bit weaving. Um, so bit weaving is sort of like the byte slicing stuff that we talked about before. Uh, where it's an alternative way to lay out your, your columnar database in memory in such a way that makes it be able to operate, uh, very, very, you can operate it very efficiently using the, the SIMD operations. And so they're going to use dictionary encoding for, for everything, all, all your data items, but then they're going to lay out the, two, the, the actual values in a fragmented way that makes it really fast to do computations. So this was implemented in a uh, prototype storage engine called QuickStep out of Wisconsin. And as I said, uh, they, they were bought by Pivotal probably last year. And then Jignesh Patel, who's now who's the, who's the database professor that was leading this project, he's now the chief scientist for at least another year at Pivotal. And Pivotal it does Greenplum. They do, uh, uh, now it's called Apache Geo, but it used to be called Gemfire XD. Pivotal is kind of a weird thing. It was like they took half of, they took you know, the database company out of EMC and the database company out of VMware and they merged them together and they made a new database company. Right? EMC bought Greenplum, VMware did their own stuff in house. They mashed them, mashed them two together and, and then they made a new, a new startup. All right, so there's basically two different layouts of bit weaving there's the vertical way and the horizontal way. I'm not going to claim any one's better than another, and I think discussing how to do the horizontal one would be difficult to do in the time that we have. So I'm just going to talk about the vertical one, because I think it's, to me, when I saw Jignesh talk about this a few years ago, uh, it sort of, the light bulb, light bulb went off in my head. I'm like, oh yeah, this is, this, is, this is pretty cool, and this is definitely why you want to use SIMD. So soon we have uh, 10 tuples, and we're going to break them up into segments, right? We'll say that each segment has, 10, has eight tuples. So this first segment has uh, zero through seven, this one has eight and nine. And what we're going to do is we're going to assume we've already done dictionary encoding for all the values in, in, in the column here. And now what we're going to do is we're going to lay out each segment such that the first bit of the value of a particular column will be laid contiguously together in memory, followed by the second bit and the third bit. Right, so this is different than like a pure column store where you would take you know, it must be exactly like this, where you would have the first tuple laid together in, for its, this attribute, followed by the second tuple. Now we're looking at, it as, at individual bits of the values. So it would look like, sort of like this. So value 0 would be all the, the, the white blocks, all the white bits. Value 1 would be all the gray bits, and then value 2 would be all the darker bits. Right? In the case of this segment here, segment 2, it only has two tuples. So you would have the, the, the bits for the first two tuples together at the beginning of the value, and the rest would be z all zeros. And then the, the, the database system would know as it processes queries that it should just ignore anything that comes after that, because it doesn't correspond to any tuple. Yes? So this, one, one attribute and the three bits of that this is one attribute and has three bits, right? and we're laying out all the bits for all the attributes contiguously in memory. Right? You can imagine if you had millions of tuples, you would have millions of values or these, these, really, these really long values. So what this is allow, gonna do, allow us to do is as we process queries and, we, and we're doing like, like sequential scans, we can do, uh, we don't have to look as, at all the data to check to see whether our predicate evaluates are true or not. All right, so let's, all right, so yeah, sorry. And this, this is, you're gonna lay out the, the segments and a value to be the process of word, and then you'll have as many values that correspond to the code width. So we have three bits, we're going to have three values. So let's say our query is select start from table where key equals CMU. So it's a simple quality predicate on, on a constant. So we'll do our dictionary encoding to come up with the bit pattern for, for this value here. So now when we want to do our valuation, right, we start off the first, the, first, the first value that corresponds to the first you know, bit slot. And we do a SIMD compare, and that's going to produce a mask for us with ones and zeros again for, for, for what actually tuples that matter. So now we can use that selective store again to say when we do 
the comparison on the next uh, bit location in our, in our constant, we only actually have to look at a subset of the values because we know the other ones didn't match on the first bit, so they'll never, they can never match it anymore when you look at the other bits. So we only need to look at, selectively look at these three here. So now when we do the next SIMD compare, we would produce a bit mask that has completely zeros. Right? So we have no tuple that's matching. So that means we don't even need to bother with the second value. So we just cut off the amount of data we have to look at by a third to produce, to produce this answer. Just by laying out all the individual bits in sequential order rather than the actual you know, encoded values. This is, not, this is not quite a compression scheme, right? The compression scheme would be the dictionary encoding. This is actually a storage layout of the data. And then they have the horizontal stuff, again, which, which I'm not going to really talk about. Uh, I think this idea is pretty novel, and I don't think any database system, unless Pivotal is actually doing this now with the quick stu stuff they bought, no database system actually does this. And I think the performance improvement you get would be quite significant because you're, you're cutting down so much on the, the, you know, the amount of data you have to look at. And all the comparisons you're doing are all vectorized anyway, so that's going to be really fast. So again, I just want to bring this up a little bit to know that there's, you know, there's other cool stuff you can do with, with vectorization. Okay, so uh, at this point, you know, in 2016, I would say vectorization is actually absolutely critical to do you know, fast evaluations for, for OLAP queries. And every single ma major database vendor that claims they're, they're supporting OLAP, whether they're disk-based or in-memory, will be doing some kind of vectorization. The MySQLs, the Postgres, and the open source guys simply can't do this. Um, another key thing to remember is that the vectorization stuff that we talked about today can be combined together to get even better improvement with all the stuff that we talked about before. So you can have multiple threads executing your, your query in parallel, right? You split the data up and have them operate in different chunks. Then each of those plans can then execute a compiled query plan that we talked about before, right? With the, the code generation stuff. And then within that compiled plan, that it can invoke the vectorized stuff that we talked about today. So you can combine everything that we talked about. They're not, they're not mutually exclusive and get amazing performance. And this is what some of the specialized systems like Hyper can do. Uh, the, the Impala guys do some of these things, right? So, so I think this is really exciting stuff. And this is, this is why like, um, there's a lot of interesting problems still in, in database research. OK. So any questions about vectorization? Yes? The quick step thing, yes. does it rely on vectorization? I think if you, Say it again? Is it, does this rely on vectorization? If you do it without vectorization, then also it should be vectorization. So it's, 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 his question is, is, this, is the bit weaving stuff completely dependent on vectorization? Right? And the answer is no. Right? You could do this comparison here. And with still cut down on Yeah, you still cut down the amount of data you have to look at. But now you'd be doing like you know individual one you know one by one or using like you know bit shifting operations to to compute the answer. But we have SIMD, might as well just use it. I was trying to uh, understand what's like the main contribution, whether it's like the layout or whether it's like using vectorization in a, uh, in a more in a better way. So his question is his statement is he was trying to figure out what the, the contribution in contribution of this is. Is it just the layout of the data? Or is it the, uh, the, the, the SIMD stuff? I think it's a combination of the two. Because this is sort of like the, the, the bit slice, uh, byte slicing stuff we talked about before. Right? Um, and again, there's the horizontal stuff, which I didn't talk about because it's more complicated. But that, that goes even further. And actually, you can, like, you can do even more stuff than you could with this. This is sort of the basic example that like, hopefully the light, light bulb goes off in your head and say, yeah, this, this, this makes sense. It's a good point, though. All right, any other questions? All right, so uh, two announcements, and I'll post this on Piazza later today. Uh, there's actually two database talks this week. Uh, so one of the, the main developers on the SAMHSA project out of uh, LinkedIn will be here on Thursday over in the CIC building at noon, and he'll give a talk about what LinkedIn is doing with SAMHSA and some of their stream processing systems. Um, and then on the 15th, we'll have the CEO and CMU alum, uh, Monty Zwieben, come give a talk about Splice Machine. The splice machine is the splice machine talk is probably more directly related to everything we've been talking about in this course because they're doing HTAP. They're doing uh, tr transactions on HBase plus analytics on Spark, all within sort of the Hadoop eco ecosystem in a single database system. Plus he's he's CMU alum. Plus there will be pizza this one, not the first one. So keep that in mind. All right, and I'll, again I'll, I'll send a reminder out uh, on Piazza about about these two talks. 
Okay? All right, so on Wednesday, two days from now, on the 13th, we'll do the status updates. Everyone gets five minutes. Uh, everyone should make PowerPoint slides or some kind of presentation. Even if your name's Prashant, yes, you should make slides. Uh, and then afterwards, you can email me your, your PDF, and then we'll, we'll retain that. Because eventually what we'll do at, at the, at the end, end of the course, we'll have on the website, we'll have a sort of a showcase about what everyone has done. I'd like, like people to share the slides for everyone so that people come along later and see you know, what do people program. They can look at your slides and see what you actually did. Okay? And then I promise I will, I will actually get your grades out today. Uh, it's grad school, nobody should be worried, right? But I'll take care of that today. All right, any questions? My phone's ringing. We're done. Thank you. <laughs>